Good evening. Our guest tonight is Michael Rotandi. Michael Rotandi is not his real name because we know him under the name Roto. Um, you will see he doesn't look like an LA guy. He looks uh, like a mixture between a Japanese, Chinese, English guy. And this uh, ca characterized his work, I would say. His open mind to uh, all cultures. His open mind to all architectural terms. And the most important thing is the most open-minded teacher I know. First time in LA, I came to an office. Saha told me, you should uh, visit uh, a team, an architecture, young architecture team. It was, I think, 30 years ago. A young architecture team called Morphosis. The address is in the Stone Avenue somewhere in LA and I found out where the Stone Avenue was because I like the name so much because it reminds me of the Rolling Stones and I expected uh, the architecture of Morphosis will be like the Rolling Stones but when I came to the office, a garage of course, Michael said I will show you some pieces, uh, architectural pieces <coughs> And the first object, the first project he showed me in reality was a building of Eric Moss. And I thought, okay, that would never ever happen in Vienna at this time. That if you come to Vienna and the guy, um, if you go to Holland, he will never show you a project as a first project of another guy like Domenico, he would love. So, this was the first very impressive uh, <coughs> attitude of Michael I got to know. The second one was, he said, okay, I will be the dean of SIAC. Would you like to come to teach on our school? And this was the beginning of my career of of being a teacher. So, Michael Rotto, much better, is of course an architect. He is of course a teacher and now he is teaching on SAG again, I think. But I think the most important thing is, and I hope we can see it today, is understanding of different things which are more than just architect. So, let's welcome Roto. It's true. <laughs> I recently spoke at uh, SIAR, and I, normally Eric Moss introduces everybody, and I asked Eric if it was okay if I introduced myself. And he was surprised. So I was thinking, how do I introduce myself? So I decided that I would be Roto, introducing Michael Roto. And what I realized was that Roto came into existence in 1989 when I met the woman that I'm currently married to, well, forever married to, April Griming. She gave me that name. She chopped off the end of my name to make a beautiful business card. And uh, so Roto introduces Michael Rotondi, and then he goes on to say that Michael Rotondi eventually married April Ryan. And uh, so I go by that name. And it, it was wonderful the, the, having Wolf come to Syrac in the very beginning, because it was a, the school was beginning to, uh, it was always a special place, but it really didn't have any presence internationally. So I thought, how do you, how do you uh, invigorate the school? And so, a new friend and some older friends we brought to teach. And 
He said, you cannot teach anything here that you've taught any place else. And then people would say, I'm not prepared. And they say, you've been preparing your whole life. So let the students see. Be extemporaneous in front of the students. Be experimental. So the school, which I'll show you some uh, images of, has always been a place that uh, we've, uh, we were raised in the school to not be afraid to make mistakes. And uh, we try to continue that now. Um, what I'm going to do, this is going to be, uh, anyways, Wolf, among others, helped us take the school to a whole other level. And now Eric has ramped up and taken it even further. Um, Cy Eric actually has been my greatest teacher. Uh, it's unusual to think of an institution as a teacher, but in the very beginning, when we started the school, it was a it was a positive outgrowth of, of, um, of the 60s. Instead of um, being angry and, and blowing things up, we decided we wanted to construct the world that we imagined and not try to change the one that already existed. And uh, we had no structure in the very beginning. There was no classes, no curriculum. We didn't even define ourselves as teachers and students, which is very unusual. What we all learned is that we had to take responsibility for our lives, which we thought conceptually we could do, but we have never learned how to do that. Our parents, our teachers, everybody would, when we woke up in the morning, would have instructions for us. And finally, we were in charge of our own lives and walked around wondering what to do. And eventually, we figured it out. So it, it can be said that the school was truly a self-organizing system. And it, over the years, organized into a society made up of a lot of, of uh, very interesting individuals. But we had uh, one thing in, uh, that, that was our common ground, which was to, for the school to survive, for us to survive, and to push architecture uh, to the next level. But it was always to be very open-minded about architecture, to bring everything in to architecture, and not try to narrow the scope. So that influenced me greatly. Um, I've stayed open-minded for a whole variety of reasons, and my interests have been very, very broad. Uh, in, in recent uh, years, I've become very interested in, in how, the, how, the, how the imagination, but then how the brain actually develops and grows, and then watched my son grow. What I've realized after so many years of both practicing architecture and teaching um, that I believe I'm a, uh, well, I feel that I'm a natural born teacher and it happens not only in the classroom. Um, I see it actually as a theory of economy. I see teaching as a theory of economy that whatever you know, you basically digest, you give it away. It's a gift economy. Um, the economy that we grew up with in America is one that you acquire, you store, you spend strategically in order to acquire more. And then any ideas that you have, you keep them to yourself because they're intellectual property, they're trade secrets, and then eventually you have a patent. Uh, right now, we think that there's great inventions in America. I don't think so. I think there's innovation, but I don't think there's very great inventions. The greatest period of invention in America was uh, a couple of hundred years ago when Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the founders of the country, had many inventions, he didn't patent anything. His belief was that anything that anybody invents should be put out into the public realm so that other people can learn as quickly as possible and then take it to the next place. America's greatest period of invention, when you look at all of the things invented in that period of time, um, it, it completely surpasses what's invented now. And Sayak was founded on the belief that it's about cooperation first, competition second. We cooperate with each other and we compete against the standard that the school sets. And then you'll see some images how we, we spatialize that. So I'm a teacher who practices architecture. Um, so this is going to be an experiment. Hopefully it will work. I've integrated the teaching and the architecture, uh, as you'll see. 
uh, and maybe it'll be coherent. I could say in the beginning, there's a saying that when you're not sure, well, if you want to hit a bullseye, first you place the target and then you shoot the arrow. And then you always get a bullseye. Um, if you're a cook, whatever the recipe, if you burn the chicken, you call it Cajun. So you come up with the concept afterwards. So this might be about non sequitur, this, this lecture. So, uh, so it's putting together, it's basically to present ideas. It's not to present an argument and say this is the way the world ought to be. So let's get started. This is a profound, uh, unshakable belief. It's all one thing, and that has meaning in a lot of different ways. This is an American story told from the point of view of the son of an Italian immigrant who drove to Los Angeles 90 years ago from New York City, believing that Los Angeles was America, and it was. He invented a life and made it possible in his own way for his four sons to invent a life, not to inherit one. Inside our home, life was based on multi-generational traditions. Outside, life was negotiated and invented. Our neighborhood friends were an eclectic group, a tribe of individual difference with a common ground, freedom to invent a life. In our formative years, with, with confidence and, and inexperience, we invented our lives, our projects, and a school in a city that was coming of age as we were coming of age. We eventually realized that it was one hybrid project. What brought us together and kept us together would give meaning to our relationships. It was all one thing. Not always evident or visible, but true. It was all one thing. He travels with me. This is homie. I forgot. So when I, when he, he goes places that I can't go. Little spaces. Okay, this is a big picture. Opinions and aspirations. Cooperation is biological necessity. Teaching and learning are fundamental to evolution. And coming from a very large family, I realize that everyone is right from their own point of view. The problem is always failing to negotiate and finding the truth in the middle. The observer is the observed, which means who I am and what I manifest in the world is me. So it's a mirror. Don't let the facts get in the way of my imagination. And humans are inherently good. Architecture, for me, has been a window into Wonderland. This has been a way to constantly learn from the people and the projects. And I've been searching for, but I'm not there, simplicity on the other side of complexity, which is distilled. What I learned from the American Indians, looking twice in order to see once. Experience and idea are a symmetry operation. And then on the personal side, I'm a teacher who practices architecture. <coughs> And I long to see the world once again as a child does, as if for the first time. A famous uh, book written by a, a, a Zen priest, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And I aspire in working with people, especially with uh, the, uh, the people in the spiritual communities, to become as transparent as possible so their ideas come to me and I give it back, as opposed to my ideas are given to them. Now, when their ideas come to me, I can to spin, of course. Um, and I think most of all, I like people. I actually love people a lot. So, and I like to make things. I wanted to um, see if there was any, any uh, um, uh, sort of physical proof to uh, centering or everything always coming back to zero, or symmetry, as it's called. Symmetry is a visual. Symmetry is conservation of energy. Everything comes back to the point of balance. Osmosis in the body, there's the, uh, the balancing between the cell membrane. Uh, homeostasis, the body's always coming back to a state of rest. In physics, third law of motion is basically reciprocal action. 
action, reaction, and then in spirit, spiritual uh, traditions, karma, what goes around, comes around. One of the biggest problems I believe uh, each of us faces, individually and we face collectively, is it possible to have a long-term vision in a short cycle world? Now we see the problems that were created by America, which day trading, short cycle thinking, creates problems when you don't have a bigger picture. So I've broken it into uh, these words, which I, con I continually uh, research and go deeper into them, uh, which I've learned to do in, in solitude, which is that there's an, old, there's an ancient system of reading where now we, we can, you can call it hypertext, or when you find the word, you click on it, and it's, it links you in. Uh, what the monks did in the, in the medieval tradition was to find a word, and to continually drill into that word, not only for days, but for months. And it basically would expand, constantly expand, as they move into it. And that's what I do with all of these words. Context has become um, uh, really big on my mind. The world that we create, in turn, recreates us. We think we're the software, I think we become the hardware. The world that we've, create, that we've created is scripting us now. And I think we got to get back control of that. Um, the Matrix, basically. We've, we've entered the Matrix. There's lots of movies. I ask my students to make lists of all of the movies that are about uh, humans versus machines. And the list is endless. It keeps on being added. And that isn't just entertainment. It's prophecy. So I think we have to be um, careful. Um, order lies within everything. Even what we think is random has order within it. Um, it's, it regulates everything. Um, at all scales, simultaneously. And then pattern is the way we read that order. It's an index of things that have already happened. Um, light is, what's fascinated me about light is that you don't see it unless it bounces off of something. Uh, I think that's quite extraordinary because uh, light and water is what is the source of light. You could have water without light. Light basically brings things um, into existence. Light is what triggers process that brings water up to the tree, as we know, photosynthesis. And then space, from the time we are basically developing in the womb, we're, we're in a space, we're near, we're near weightlessness, and that is the medium for the body taking in the information in the combination with light. Light bounces off of beauty, beauty comes in. Light bounces off of ugly, ugly comes in. And then scale, scale shifting, scale and, and for us as architects, is, is very matter of fact, but scale, in fact, is a way to shift from one thing to another. So scale shifting is how the mind moves from here and now out to the universe. It travels time, basically, and, and, and distances in a nanosecond. And so scale shifting is a way we convert through metaphor uh, any thought into any other thought, any word into any other word. And then gathering, which is basically the beginning of civilization. The context for me begins with looking at the cell. The cell, the molecule in the cell, has the DNA molecule, has a holographic memory of the entire body. Wherever that molecule ends up in the body, that's only, that triggers only that part of the memory that's essential. That to me is quite extraordinary. Uh, if that wasn't as sophisticated as that, we'd have body parts in the wrong places. So I begin to imagine that maybe an architecture can operate in the same way, that architecture has basically the DNA, of uh, the latent DNA of, of, of all human societies. So the context is personal. The family, which I came from a family that um, tradition was inside the house, invention was outside the house. 
and then Cyarc, as I spoke, and then the city itself, Los Angeles, which is a, is a very um, large but very surprising city, keeping the integrity of all of the different ethnicities as it continually grows into uh, a greater and greater whole. Is it possible that at the moment of birth, we are potentially all-knowing? If the DNA molecule has all of that information in it, I believe it's possible that the human body is the equivalent DNA molecule for the universe. We've been raised to believe that we're empty when we're born. I don't think we're definitely not empty. And then the teachers have to fill us up. Not true. The way we learn is by the, the, the knowledge that is stored inside, that's latent. Something connects from the outside, the knowledge is on the inside, and then that's the way sight occurs. In the first four years of birth, in the first four years from the time you're born, the cells in the, in, in, in the visual cortex are waiting for the light outside to come inside in order to now record events and images. And then the next time, that memory is there. I believe that it, all knowledge is, is stored inside of us in the same way it wants to connect with what's inside. If you're born blind and you have an eye transplant at 10 years old, you're still blind. The cells that were in the visual cortex have left and now the other senses have taken over. Great book um, by Darcy Thompson on growth and form. In many things, but in the human body in particular, things will change size, but they don't change shape. So everything is growing at its own speed, but in proportion, so it ends up at the finish line at the same time. That I find extraordinary. We're a learning organism, both individually and collectively. As groups, we learn collectively from each other and the events that we create uh, together. Um, from the time you're when you're put down on the ground and you begin to crawl, that's the period when your brain grows the fastest because you're taking in an immense amount more information and you're, you need more RAM. So the brain grows faster at that period of time than any other time. And then the memory begins to deepen. Greatest number of nerves and the most sophisticated part of the nervous system go from the fingertips to the brain and then equal the num number of nerves come back. So each time you experience something, the memory of the prior experience comes to the fingertips. <laughs> we can describe how this happens, but we can't explain it. Life is truly a mystery. I was on a plane recently from China, 11 hours, I'm having a conversation with a, with a scientist who's doing um, really interesting things, pulling apart the DNA molecule of all things, and then putting them back together, not because he was interested in genetics. He said that the memory of the DNA molecule is so intense, no other part of the body has that kind of memory. He wanted to see what he could do with it. So he pulls apart the two strands, puts together four strands, and then he starts connecting the four strands, and he goes from basically a two-dimensional plane to a volume, and he starts making a gel out of it. He takes the gel, he puts it into a mold, and then he puts it into water. He takes it out of the water, puts it into another mold. It takes another shape, and then another shape, and another shape. He puts it back into the water. It goes back to its original shape. So I ask him, is the memory in the gel, or is it in the water? He goes, I don't know. And I said, it's a mystery. He goes, no, there's no mysteries in science. There's no mysteries in science. So we spent three hours discussing whether mystery has a place in science. So this made me start to think, um, what was lost or gained when alchemy became chemistry? That was when we went from the age of faith into the age of reason. And then I continued, 19th century, the age of society, technology, and then in the 20th century, the age of economy and wealth, and then everything goes haywire, as we all know. Now, I'm very optimistic, so I believe 
that this is the beginning of the process of coming back together. Like everything else, things come apart, things come back together. And we're now going to be moving into the age of humanity. It's your generation that's going to take us there. My generation messed up. Except for some great things that a few have done. What is lost is wisdom. So it's an Italian immigrant family, mother, father from Italy, come to Los Angeles, because my father said, when I asked him, why didn't you stay in New York? He said, I wanted to live in America. I said, wasn't New York America? And he goes, no. I go, why not? He says, when I was born in the old country, I'm sitting around the dinner table. I have the same seat my whole life until I come to America. Everybody, the hierarchy of the family is defined by where you sit around the table. And I said, well, what happened when you came to America? And he said, I had the same goddamn seat. When he was with his family in America, he had the same seat. So he said to my mother, let's get in the car, we're going to the coast, which was California. He goes, now I sit anywhere I want. Now, I didn't realize that every night at dinner, we never sat in the same seat. And I never knew why. He would sit down some, wherever. So whoever you wanted to speak to, that's where you sat. When I went back to visit, 20 years after the first meeting with my mother and father's family, four years old, 24 years old, 24 years old, I sit down someplace, and the rest of the family is moving around the table. They don't sit down. And I'm wondering what's going on. My uncle asks me to move. I move over to the seat he assigns to me. I sit down. I flash back 20 years. It's the same goddamn seat from 20 years before. And then everybody else sits down. And I realize the conversations are all the same. You know, a little bit deeper voices, but... <laughs> what you'll notice is my head there, I'm the short guy. My head there is the same size as now. When I was born, my mother said I came out like this. <laughs> Things changed, and we didn't expect them to change. And uh, it was scary, but <coughs> when you're young, uncertainty is a friend. So it was uh, time to take advantage. What we knew in 1968 is that we were not going to inherit the life of our father. Right now, it's the same thing. It's scary coming out and going out into the world now that's kind of messed up. The great advantage that young people have now is that you don't have to inherit the life of your father or mother. You can invent your, you have to invent your own life if you're going to survive. And the world always changes beginning with the students. It starts in the universities and goes out onto the streets. But at the same time, the flip side, And then while everything was going crazy, for a brief moment, something like this happens and it makes our imagination take hold once again and we're excited. And then I decided, okay, what are the two basic human motivations? Love and fear. And, this is, and, and the objective is to try to stay in the middle, which is really, really hard. And you're never on completely on one side. I asked uh, 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 someone, one, a, a guy that worked for me, he's a Tibetan Lama, he's an architect, graduated from Syrah. I asked him, if the Dalai Lama ever got angry? And he goes, oh, yes. And I went, yeah, right. He gets angry. But when he gets angry, his voice doesn't change. His finger hits the table. He said, when he gets angry, when the finger hits the table harder and harder and harder, but his voice stays the same. I tried doing that, but you've got to practice. It hurts the finger. So for us, the anger that we had at the university uh, turned into joy. The question that we asked, how much time do we want to spend trying to change the mind of people who don't want their minds changed? You spend all day. We said, what's the answer? The answer is, leave them alone and go do what you want to do someplace else. 
And that's what we did. The longest school in the world. This is really important. Um, I think, um, in retrospect, how the school grew so quickly was through cooperation. Yeah, we fight, and it's just like in a family. The family I grew up in, kissing was an act of love, but so was biting, you know? So, they come together. But cooperation uh, is an idea, but the way we make that idea physical, spatial, is all the work that's produced on one side immediately goes to the other side. And that side is 800 feet long. And then we tell the students when you, and then what you do to get everybody to walk is you put the bathrooms very far apart. They're at both ends. And then when they walk to school, we tell them to take their sketchbooks and to copy whatever they see, but then acknowledge who you're looking at and tell them. And then once a year, we buy, uh, Thanksgiving, we buy a pie for everybody in the school. So there's 500 uh, pumpkin pies, and it makes 400 feet. I've seen Los Angeles go from second growth all the way to what we might consider seventh growth right now. And it gets more and more complex as time goes on. 135 languages, 135 different ways to drive. And they're all in my neighborhood. It's true, you know? The Chinese drive like they're always looking for a parking space, you know? In Spanish, there's no word for line in the road. So they go like this, you know? The Armenians are always out the window yelling like this, you know? And I'm, you know, for me it's like riding the rapids in the river. I, I, it's really a lot of fun, if you're ready for it. <laughs> so the city, I realize, has an impact on, any city has an impact on your psyche. Los Angeles, because of the different types of ordering systems, uh, has, has definitely an interest on, on our psyche. So the spatial system, of course, is the grid. Uh, the movement system is, is basically that. This is one of the great freeway intersections. I went up in a helicopter. After it rains, the air becomes very clear, and you can see a lot, so I went up in a helicopter and took a lot of photographs. This is one of them. And then the communication systems is this. Now, how do you bring all these uh, together? That's the... I then mapped all the places that I've lived, and I've never moved more than two miles from where I was born, which was depressing for a moment, uh, but then I travel so much. But this is the area where first uh, Frank Lloyd Wright came, and then uh, Schindler, and then Neutra, and then the second and third generation came after that. And then there was a period when not a whole lot happened, and then the 70s. So just above the A is where I live. And that's all the, the greatest mixture of ethnicities. This is. Uh, so what I've done is I'll, I'll, I'll show you um, images that relate to the word and then uh, a few images of projects that I think relate. This is a school of architecture in Texas. House in New Jersey. Once my phone went off when I was giving a lecture, and I'm looking around ready to blame somebody, and it's me. So I figure I gotta open it up. And I pretend that if somebody give me advice on hurry up the lecture is boring. <laughs> One time my zipper was open. <laughs> it's true. And I didn't have a podium. And so a friend comes up and he leans over and he goes, Look, but your zipper's open. And then, you know, as soon as your zipper's open, you look down. <laughs> and then I look up and I go, oh no, everybody's looking at my crotch. You know? <laughs> so I started talking about what it feels like to have your zipper open in front of 500 people. <laughs> what do you do? You 
go with it. You burn the chicken, you call it Cajun. <laughs> this is the house. This, in many ways, even though you don't admit it when you're young, is inspired uh, by rooftops. Rooftops. <laughs> I did it first. That's what architects always say. They change the date on things. I did it first. <laughs> oh, did you see? No, I, did. I don't read. I don't read. You know? <laughs> Everything comes. It comes from God to me and out. <laughs> I don't read. I don't look at anything. I'm blind, actually. <laughs> Still context. There's always lots of ideas that we add to projects to make it sound like it's theoretical. This big orange ball, um, the largest shipbuilders in the world are in Nagasaki, and they put these balls and they put gas inside and send them across the ocean. And so when I was doing this project in Nagasaki, I saw it and I go, I want one of those. You know? And I said, what are you going to do with it? I go, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so it goes on top of the building. And then the governor, I get a call from the governor's office. Everybody thinks it's going to blow up. So he says, you must come to Nagasaki for a, a, a news conference. And I go, okay. Man, it's very formal in Japan. You know? So I'm very nervous. I go, oh, what am I going to say? And they say, why? What's in orange ball? They say, why green? And I say, you don't have to conjugate verbs in Japan. Why green? I go, like mountain. And they go, why blue? Because there's blue on your side. I go, oh, like sea. And they go, why orange? I go, like orange. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, hi, Rota. <laughs> I'm doing a hospital and a, a hospital for big birds. Big birds, like that. Amazing. So I had to go in the cave with the eagles, which is scary. But the eagle was eating something else and not me. So, so it's um, hospital on one side and uh, enclosures on the other. And then a great project for me is 500 acres in the mountains um, for a monastery for Tibetan Buddhists in California. And a temple. Translating how to do construction documents on a building like that. This is a project where you have to receive, you have to become very transparent because it's not about me expressing my will, it's about me helping them restore their culture. And then a building on Hollywood Boulevard that we just finished, which is public space essentially, it's a black box, but it's public space at the ground and on the roof. <coughs> and then the, uh, the problems that uh, Japan has been facing as we're thinking about process quite a bit, and the nature of impermanence, which is considered um, in wisdom traditions to be a profound awareness that everything is constantly changing moment <coughs> to moment. So I put together images that I um, got when I was, I was working in Hawaii for a while, and it, things come back again, it's the eternal return, it's a cycle of change. Ch time is progressive, but it's also cyclical. And it returns once again. <coughs> so in these projects, I am truly uh, the student and uh, the, the lamas and the shaman that I work with are the teachers. And this is a centerpiece of life practice. So this is a way I can um, one of the things that I've become, uh, I asked myself 20 years ago, it was a very special uh, two events that happened. Um, I wondered, and I still wonder, is it possible to integrate intellectual practice, which is primarily architecture, and spiritual practice, matters of the mind and matters of the heart. When I say spiritual, I don't mean religion. It just means matters of the mind and matters of the heart. And there's certain projects that um, allow me to continually practice while I'm doing architecture. So I have to immerse myself in not only that culture, but in their practices. So if I want to know what meditation is like, I have to go into two weeks silent meditations multiple times before I know what it's like for the mind, how hard it is to make your mind 
quiet and your body still. And then the architecture has to do the same because you're bringing in information at a much more rapid pace when your body gets into that state. <clears throat> Lama G, he likes that. He thinks, oh, I'm a hip hop guy, huh? I go, yeah, Lama G. Lama Gyatso. <laughs> Extraordinary, eminent Lama Gyatso. Good guy. So I, 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 I pretend, I, I say to myself, I'm on full scholarship. Um, so this is my pro bono work. And then I've done work with American Indians. And then learn from them uh, their <laughs> systems of reading the sky and bringing it to the earth. And then trying to develop buildings that are not only have a practical use, but have a profound use. Which I'll show you. And then we're doing a, a project, 100,000 little, 99,000 little stupas and one big stupa on something that is um, um, basically paraphrasing the Bora Badur, in, uh, also in California for another Tibetan group. And it's to house the Matea, the, the uh, Treya uh, Buddha, which is the female Buddha. And then in China, I've been working uh, in another monastery. It started some years ago and it's come back again. And they wanted to know how, through architecture, can you go from tradition to invention. And after weeks and weeks and weeks, we ended up with the obvious. <clears throat> and then working with uh, Middle Easterns on a bazaar in the Middle East on how to expand it, but also bring it back to its traditions instead of making it commercial. This is the plains of Nazca in Peru. And then what surprised me is, was the, the um, Doxiadis, a planner in, in, um, in Athens, um, did an analysis of the temple sites and he came up with a very complex system of geometry that is recurring. The, ex the conceptual order is very precise. How you perceive it is quite the opposite, which was very surprising. So, but there is a belief that your body can pick up ordering systems even though the eyes can't see it. The eyes are part of the brain, so it's a dissipative structure, whereas the body is a rhythmic structure, so the body picks up numerical systems that are manifest much quicker than the brain does. The brain enhances. And then right now, I don't know what, um, where this is going to end up, but it might be that it's, it's going to take us back to the global village that Marshall McLuhan proposed 40 years ago. Right now, there's a lot of nonsense uh, that occurs. But. And then the information, the life force that's inside the body, that uh, intuit, is intuitive. Um, about 20 years ago, I decided that I wanted to see if I can mine the body like an encyclopedia. That's why I started going through a number of practices, and I still do acupuncture once a week. and then the intellectual version. This uh, house, um, the objective was simply to see how complex we can make something, and is it possible to make it coherent? And so we set up this system of rules that were manifest geometrically and then materially. And then, and it, it's, it's, it's drawn two-dimensionally, but it's, it's, it's conceived as a three-dimensional system. This started with the, the lotus flower. The lotus flower, when you draw it, it's a pentagram and it's a golden ratio. And then out of that, we wanted to develop uh, this. This is also a project in China and then Japan again taking the seven sacred mountains around Nagasaki and trying to figure out how to get them to the site.
So that the building becomes a depository of uh, meaning that is already present there before we arrive. The School of Architecture came from working with the students on music. I asked them to, to draw their favorite piece of music, and the drawing had to be as long as their body. And they had to do basically the melodic line and the rhythmic beat. And I was surprised at the diversity of music uh, that they came up with, and then we um, uh, basically pulled it all into one drawing. In the rainforest of Costa Rica, what surprised me was everything is food for everything else. I was expecting a botanical garden, which everything is in its place. This is now my new model for understanding how everything can coexist simultaneously and benefit everything. There is an utter stillness in the dynamic process of everything being food for everything else. When you're in there, you can feel its steady state. It's utterly still and quiet. So the star knowledge of the Lakota, which are the plains of the United States, the Indians that live in the plains, they saw the relationship between practical and profound. So when they read the sky, it was a spirit for their spiritual journey, but it was also for geography, physical geography. So it was basically their GPS system for their body moving through space and their soul, or spirit, because they don't say soul, they don't have a soul. This was one of their journeys through the Black Hills. And this is their symbol for unity, but it's also the symbol which the teepee comes out of. So the teepee is a symbol for creation uh, on the horizon, which is where humans exist. So the horizon is the zone of creation. This isn't Photoshop, by the way. This is actually an iceberg melting. I said, rather curious that it melts in this way. But it's pretty amazing. This still, I find uh, amazing that all of that color, when you put it together, it becomes a white beam and it's a laser. And that becomes a metaphor for my energy. If my energy is like that, um, it's when it comes together and it's the focus that I can go deep, actually. And it burns, as we know, a laser burns steel. But light also carries data or information. Not only through the fiber, light bouncing around takes information off of that wall and into our bodies.
All of the color and finishes on all of the projects um, we work on with uh, April Griman. This is our little spa in the desert. Next winter, if any of you get really, really cold, this is hot water. Very sweet hot water. Just think of this. Only seven rooms, so you better make your reservations fast. This is April Griman's studio. The building is instrument. This uh, on the reservation is placed in a way where the sun, the summer solstice and the winter solstice come through. Nesting and flying. Renewal and creativity. And then this allowed us to now virtually put things in space before we build them. So things changed as this entered our intelligence and our psyche. And we begin to see things quantum state. This is a road to the second mesa, which is the oldest human settlement in the United States. This is the Hopi Indians. It's been there for a couple of thousand years. This is actually a great road also when it gets, there's no light at nighttime. When it's dark, you turn off your headlights and you take your hand off the steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> It's better to do it when your loved one is not in the car. She gets scared. What's also great in the desert is you can bring your car out into the desert. And you know how the car moves very slowly by itself without your foot on the accelerator? Well, you can get out of the car while it's moving and walk along <laughs> the desert and then get back in the car. You know? Such a liberating feeling. So you keep on getting out and you walk around. Maybe, you know. You have some water, some juice, and then you get back in the car, you go, yeah. <laughs> So I'm always experimenting. I'm always experimenting. And April goes, what are you doing? I'm always trying to figure things out. And sometimes I'll just stare at something while I'm trying to figure it out. And she gets, it's embarrassing. It looks like I just took you out of the home. You know, because I, I go like that. And she makes fun. She goes, come on, we got to go back now. You know, so I go walking real slow next to This is a freeway that they were building in Los Angeles. I love that. We don't have gates into temples. We have freeways in Los Angeles. This is a quarry in Carrara. Ah. This is the way we drive in Los Angeles. <laughs> These are great spaces to get your, and then this. This was designed by Wolf. <laughs> this he puts his clients on so it feels normal when they look at the projects. <laughs> I know his secrets. He told me don't tell him his secrets. <laughs> Is it possible to move fast in slow motion? That was one of the great wonders in this scene for me uh, in The Matrix. Yeah, where the guy is moving really fast and Neo is moving really slow. It's like in Blazing Saddles. Anybody, there was a movie, Blazing Saddles? The fastest gun in the West. Huh? Okay. This is the fastest gun in the West. I should. Ready? You want to see it again? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> That's how fast I can be. <laughs> this is my son's house. The scale shifting that's happening in China is uh, off the charts. And what isn't considered is how the, bo the body, um, the medium of the body, which is space, and then what defines the space, uh, has taken thousands of years to get to a place where it knows its environment, even with the eyes closed. And then the shifting scale isn't gradual. It goes from this to this. The Chinese have always been able to work at immense scale and small scale. But it also goes from this to that. I do believe that we're hardwired to long for not only communion but pressing flesh. Why do we come together? <clears throat> the barn is important, but communion is more important. So that's why they continually do this. I think this is the way we work in the schools of architecture. The creative moment is a very intimate moment, a very private moment, but then whatever you discover becomes public. And it's not only presented, it's shared with everyone else, and that's the important thing. The bees and the ants and the termites and the wasps have known this. They are, first and foremost, altruistic, which means generous, and then, they're hardly ever, they're, if they become an individual, they get kicked out. What I've realized and seen in Los Angeles, whenever there's been, uh, the four seasons in Los Angeles are, as we say, the fire, the rain, the mudslides, and the earthquakes. Those are the four seasons. <laughs> Each of those events, whenever they happen, everybody becomes altruistic. Everybody cooperates and cares for each other. And then, within minutes, you start doing that again. Is it possible to be altruistic in the best of times? In the best of times, not just worst of times. <laughs> That's in uh, Portugal. In... We actually were dancing. And then in Iran, I was in Iran just before the elections, and I always have a list when I go. I say, I'll come if you, and then I wanted to see the whirling dervishes. That's the offices from hand to mouse. One of the ways we communicate with each other at this table
Rick's nice, but he can get angry sometimes, you know? <laughs> hey, what are you doing? No. Get that over there, over there. So the quest is that, basically. Challenges the depth of our memory. Global interactions that challenge our local identities. The needs as people live in societies being confronted by the autonomous logic of human institutional structures and their concepts of power, politics, and money. Forces of nature that are scales beyond real comprehension, let alone preparation. All of these issues and the potential problems that arise are hugely difficult ones and possibly cannot be overcome in the long term. So why should we try, one might ask? Because it's the right thing to do and because creative people like big problems. The bigger the problem, the bigger the motivation, the bigger the smile. It's a gift to be an architect. It's definitely a gift to be a teacher. And now I can say after so many years, it's truly a gift to have so many friends and comrades. Like all of you, I'm blessed. So, love to see you all. Thank you. Taking questions. You can ask questions in any category. Sports, entertainment. Or <laughs> Your life. You want some advice. <laughs> Actually, years ago when I first started teaching it, the students would say, I'm having trouble at home because I'm here so much. I'm not there so much. What should I do? And I say, get rid of them. You can always get another mate. <laughs> <laughs> this is your career. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. No, I'd say, you know, you can work on both at the same time. So. <clears throat> questions? So. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> your projects often are rooted in something that is a program that's spiritual, whether you know religious or just some kind of ancient civilization that has a certain type of lifestyle that makes it a very unique piece of, let's say, architecture as an architect. What is that like for you as a, you know, engaging yourself in that type of experience and how does that change you? How does that affect the next project? How does that affect what types of projects you do? It's a very unique process compared to other architects? Uh, I, I think generally architects, um, first I believe that all of us become architects or we go into creative work, uh, but in architecture which I know best, um, I would say for the same reason, which is to try, to, we believe that you can, it's possible to make a difference in the world, to make the world better. Um, and then we, uh, when you're young, uh, um, the objective is to put your mark on things, um, which I still can do if I want. Um, but uh, most of the work that seems to come to me, uh, well, I, I'm, I, it's interesting now, even the work that I'm doing, I've, I've recently been attracting um, 30 somethings that are what I would call serial entrepreneurs. And they're going into what is called uh, uh, social. They're social entrepreneurs, where they're trying to figure out how do you how do you do good and do well. How do you make money and uh, do positive things in the world to bring it back uh, to a place where things seem to be in balance once again. And what's interesting, years ago I was asked, how do you where did you how did you market yourself to get the Indian work or the Buddhist work? And I say, I've never done conventional marketing which isn't really good for getting a practice to grow, so I decided I'm going to keep my practice at the same size, and I'm comfortable with that. So it varies from anywhere from 5 to 15 people, depending on the work. But I do what, it's, what, I, what I now understand is psychic marketing. You know, 
the kind of life that I've constructed for myself and the kind of relationships that I've established uh, tend to attract people, not only in the, the spiritual realms, but people that are interested, the younger people, the 30-somethings, that are not only looking at me for my experience as an architect, but asking me to help sort of guide them through. Because now I see that my primary role when I say I'm a teacher is not just in the classroom. I really want to download. I want to zero out before I die. I want to take everything in and put it back out again before I check out. I want to go out light. I want to be like at zero when I go out. Now, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's, like the, it's like a project when you have a due date and you're like this and then you go, uh oh, and then you bend the lines. Yeah, it might be like that. But um, the work is, when I say a window into one, Wonderland, uh, the one thing we know, when we work on projects is that you learn about a city, you learn about the people. If it's in a different country, you learn about that country. Well, you can go even deeper and deeper and deeper. And in certain projects, you're basically learning about yourself. And as you're working on the project, you're working on yourself. And there's certain projects that you can't do unless you are in the same, trying to, you're close to the same place. Like, you, I can't be working on, on the Tibetan stuff or any of the Buddhist stuff unless I practice that as well. I don't practice it as a religion. I practice it as, as an everyday life practice. Um, I always, it started, when I was wondering why was I, well, I we all, we're all curious when we're young, and then I think public education gets rid of the curiosity. We basically, we're, imagine floating in for 10 months, you've not only, your body in your cells, is creation itself. Right? Boom, boom, and then all of a sudden, you know, arms, legs, hands, you know, the whole thing. We've lived creation. That has to be stored. The same way I can walk from one place to the other, and my body remembers, your cells remember everything they've experienced. And the only time you can get, not you never get access to that, but you can get within the afterglow, you can get the cosmic rays of that, when you are still and your mind is quiet. And then that's like the light that becomes the laser. And it doesn't go this way. It goes this way. It goes this way. The objective in, in, in meditation isn't to negotiate with God. That's what I learned as a Catholic. I was always negotiating with God. Oh, please let me win the football game. You know, please let me ace this test. You know, please let me get a good critique. Uh, and then I'd say, okay, I'll give you three. Okay, I'll give you six. Okay, I'll give you a year. That isn't what, that, that, that I think is, is uh, where we tend to go wrong. Prayer uh, isn't to negotiate. Prayer is like poetry. Prayer is to move yourself into a state of being that you then start to realize that everything is inside you as opposed to everything is outside you. Uh, there are certain projects that allow you to do that. Uh, architecture really is a, a lens, uh, but it's also access into worlds that we otherwise wouldn't have access to. And, uh, when I was, a, uh, I was the youngest growing in my family, I was the youngest in my family, and the only way I could hang out with my older brothers is if I was clever. And I had to always be, I had to know what they knew, and I had to know what their friends knew, so that I could sort of bring it up, you know, and talk about it. And then I learned how to make up stories, which was, my wife actually, when we first met, we were boyfriend and girlfriend for 18 years. Uh, she didn't want to get married. I kept on, I kept on trying to trick her. Can you want to get married? Or, Want to get married? No. And then finally, three years ago, she says, she asked me, do you want to get married? I said, yes. <laughs> so we got married secretly. Uh, anyways, when, well, she, she, she thought that uh, um, she, heard, she would hear, we'd go on, she'd go on with, with me on lectures, and then after about the 10th lecture, she says, can I be direct? And I go, yeah, she goes, you're a liar. I go, why, why do you say I'm a liar? And she says, every time you tell the story, it's different. <laughs> and I say, well, a storyteller has a responsibility. You know? <laughs> well, what I didn't know then, I started to wonder about that. Well, it turns out, I've just been reading, actually the last few days, I'm reading about optimism is also biological necessity. Optimism is connected to the memory, but then memory isn't just to recall the past. Memory is to help you anticipate the future. And so every time memory comes out in a new context, like the DNA molecule, it's transformed. My wife said, bullshit, you're a liar. <laughs>
So the story goes on and on. But anyways, with my brothers, I reach, I reach a level of autonomy where I realize it's just so, I want to know everything about everything before I die. That's just, you know. So I'm always busy. I'm always busy. And I've learned how to walk through the world even when I'm having fun with my friends. And I'm always looking at things and I'm trying to synthesize it. And then I fill up one of these about every two weeks. I'm just always trying to, so what this also does, this is an external hard drive. The same way language, that's one of the things that really fascinated me. The brain, it grew to a point and then it had to create folds in order to increase the surface area, in order to increase memory. And then it had to max out, otherwise the head just keeps getting bigger and bigger and the head can't get getting bigger and bigger. It stays inside and guess what? As soon as the brain reaches its period of, of, of full development physically, language comes out. So language is a memory system. It's not just a means of communicating. It's a way to store knowledge. And then that knowledge becomes common to all of us. So I start to see many things as kind of external hard drive, people around me. But I'm always trying to reverse engineer stuff so that I can learn from every situation. It's just, how did it get like that? And that began in earnest when my son was starting to ask me the, the, the most profound question of all is why? You know, why is the sky blue? You give an answer. Next question is why? I got another answer. Next question is why? Well, I'm four whys in. And I say, I gotta go, I'll be back in about two, three hours. He goes, where are you going? I go, I gotta do some research, son. Yeah. <laughs> and I realize that you can constantly just sort of drill in and drill in and drill in. Uh, so the architecture, yeah, you gotta get the job done. It's got a, a schedule to it, but you work long hours, not just to get the project done, but to, to try to learn as much as possible. And then if you're fortunate to work with people that know a lot more than you about a lot of things, if you know how to ask them questions, you can get them to download, which is better than books on tape. Like this scientist on the, on the, on the plane. Usually I don't talk on a plane. I figure, okay, especially 11 hours, 12 hours going from China. I go, this is great, alone time. I really like, I love having meetings with myself, you know, I really do. I love solitude, I like being in community, but I like solitude. And one, actually, a really extraordinary experience was my first silent retreat. Silent retreat, not only you can't speak, there's a hundred people, you can't have eye contact, no eye contact. So, well, you're going to bump into people. Well, you learn to pick up, you start to recognize shoes and kneecaps. And then you start to recognize body movement, and then, the most uncanny thing, you start to perceive energy. What was the most amazing and uncanny thing is in the dining room, a hundred seats. By the fifth day, your seat was always vacant. Everybody keeps moving around until they feel the energy where they are comfortable. You sit down and you can feel heat coming off of people's bodies or twitching. Your body begins to pick, your body is the most extraordinary sensing, storing, retrieving, and transmitting into human existence. Anything that we construct outside of ourselves doesn't compare to the body. The body, through intuition, we create technology. Now, technology definitely enhances us. Anyways, there's lots of stuff that I learned from uh, doing the work. And then, I have to remain open-minded to see what I can, whether I understand what I'm working with. And there was a time when uh, I, would, I would say um, architecture gives form to life. And there's a lot of really wonderful architecture that's done that. Now, in the last 20 years, I say life gives form to architecture. And so I try to be open to whatever's happening and then see what can come out of that. And then the real test is whether or not I have the confidence to do that. And sometimes, and, and whether I have the confidence to make mistakes, to make mistakes. That's, the, in a risk-averse world, when you have to perform at the same level all of the time, we tend, we tend to repeat ourselves. We tend to repeat ourselves. It's really difficult to not be afraid, to have the courage to make mistakes. Where I first learned that was the, the first director of the school, Ray Cappy. He puts me, he says, do something with the graduate students. They go, do what? You know, do what? He goes, I don't know, make a program or something. Because there was no structure in the school, none. 
we were starting to get a lot of students that were doing graduate work, but they were all mixed in. So I said, Ray, I don't know what to do. What am I going to do? I don't know. I'm too young. I, 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 never, I never went to director school. He goes, the worst that can happen is you'll screw it up. <laughs> I said, I could do that. He says, and then I said, then what? He goes, well, then, you know, figure it out and do it again. Well, that got me reading on who else has had that attitude. Well, in the United States, the three high technology zones are Silicon Valley, which we all know, Austin, Texas, and then North Carolina. Those are the three basically big uh, areas where technology. I wanted to know how much investment, how much invention comes out of that. Is it related to money? Well, it turns out that Silicon Valley has had the least amount of invention, even though it's in the billions, the least amount of invention of those uh, of investment of those other two places. The largest number of inventions. Well, when you dig deeper, the firm that the, the venture capitalists that were doing the largest amount of, of, of investment, the first question they would ask anybody, have you ever failed? If they said no, then they'd say, see you later. Have you ever failed? Yes. What did you learn from your failure? Oh, this is what I learned. And then they start describing what they're going to do next based on what they learned. And they said, you got the money. You got the money. So roll the dice. It comes up snake eyes. You pick up the dice, you roll them again. Yeah. This is attitude if you're something that comes with age, that you have to go through your phase of youth and being full of That's amazing. It's symmetrical. It's symmetrical. Somebody asked me to talk to museum educators the other day about risk. How can you encourage people to take more risk? And I was thinking about it. As a child, there's no word as risk. You're learning. Everything you do is for the first time. So in the beginning, you're always taking chances, even though you don't see it as that. And then it does. It comes, it can come at the end. Where uh, yeah, it comes with age, uh, I think. Um, I would like to say that, you know, 30 years ago was that way, but no, it wasn't. I mean, there was actually a time when, uh, I think I had just graduated from school, and I stopped reading. I said, okay, I know enough, I'm just going to stop reading, you know. And when I thought about it, I said, what I was really, I didn't want to upset the apple cart, as they say. I thought I, the stuff that I knew was so tentative that I thought if I read something new, I didn't know how to integrate it, so I decided I wasn't going to read anymore. But then I went into delusion and said, I don't need to know anything else. Now, I read, even the way I read now, I have a hard time reading my Kindle. Because I don't read successive pages. I open, and, I open things and I open something else, and I'm always reading things that seem to be unrelated topics in order to try to synthesize them into one topic, into one topic, by going to the first principles. If you go, I, I saw Bucky Fuller lecture once for five hours, and he talked about all the knowledge areas. I said, man, this guy's got an amazing memory. Well, what I discovered over time was that if you go down into first principles, all knowledge is, if you see, see knowledge as a sphere, all the knowledge is out here on the surface. Now, first of all, you only see a portion of the surface because it goes around the event, around the horizon. You've got to ask somebody else on the other side what's happening. Also, you've got to memorize it all. If you go down into first principles, everything is the same. Essentially, when you get down into the first principle, the movement, the, area, the, the degree of movement is very, very small. So you begin to understand that, in principle, everything behaves the same way when you get down uh, into uh, first principles. And so when you're reading, it's not just trying to understand all this stuff. It's trying to go deep. And the only way you can go deep is by reading science philosophy of science, and uh, there's lots of things now that are, are written for lay people, so, anyways, so, dinner time? Okay, thank you very much.